All right, by my clock, it is now 5.04 p.m. We have exceeded the 101 person count on our webinar, so we'll go and get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Anton Scalia Law School. Uh, we're excited today to host our first NATSEC Nightcap, which is our first our webinar series uh, for friends of the National Security Institute, uh, members of the general public, um, and, uh, and experts and, and the average person who's interested in these national security issues. Uh, we're pleased, very pleased today to have one of our advisory board members, uh, retired uh, Army General, uh, General Keith Alexander, uh, Army four star, uh, former director of the National Security Agency, the founding commander of US Cyber Command, and for better or for worse, my direct boss uh, in, my, in our job, my job, my day job at Ironnet Cybersecurity, where he's the founder chairman and co-CEO of IronNet. So, uh, General Alexander, thanks for joining us. I'm going off mute now. Well, <laughs> off mute. All right, yes, hey, hey Jamil, it's an honor to be here. So, uh, General, you know, um, obviously you've been in national security for a long time, uh, but not a lot of folks, not necessarily everybody on, the, on, on this call knows what the National Security Agency is or what U.S. Cyber Command is. Could you just give us a little bit of sort of one your, your history in the military, you've served our country for, for two, or well over two decades. Uh, what, what is NSA? What is U.S. Cyber Command? What was your role there? Um, and, uh, and, and what were you doing protecting our nation? Oh, looks like we have a little bit of a lag here. I don't know if that's on my end or on our end. Reed, can you uh, hear General Alexander? Uh, I cannot. I am working to figure out the problem. Okay. Uh, well, it appears that General Alexander might be frozen uh, on his side. So uh, uh, we will, uh, we'll, uh, Reed is going to work with General Alexander to get him back online. In the meantime, let me tell you a little bit about his background. Um, General Alexander served in the, in the military for over 40 years. Um, he, um, he was the head of the National Security Agency from 2005 to 2014, the longest serving uh, director of the NSA. Um, I see he's left us, so he'll be joining us here shortly again. Apologies for the, uh, for the hiccup. Um, prior to joining Cyber Command and NSA, uh, General Alexander had a, a variety of senior leadership roles, um, including being the Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence in the Army, as well as the Commanding General of U.S. INSCOM, the U.S. Army's Intelligence and Security Command, as well as the Director of Intelligence for U.S. Central Command. One of the key efforts that General Alexander worked on when he was uh, NSA Director was taking intelligence, a collective from signals intelligence, which historically, um, that's the kind of communications intelligence you get from phones, emails, and the like. Historically, that had taken days and weeks and months to turn from collected intelligence to finished intelligence. Um, and so what John Alexander did at NSA was take that data and move it from being days and weeks to being minutes and seconds. So taking data and making it immediately actionable for warfighters in the field. Uh, one of the biggest initiatives uh, that, I, that I know he was credited for uh, in particular by General Petraeus when he was a director of intelligence for U.S. CENTCOM and then, and then at director of NSA, was changing the game in Iraq, where they took data from terrorist-captured cell phones, were able to process that data rapidly and immediately make it available to warfighters so that when they wrapped up a single terrorist, they grabbed their cell phone, grabbed their devices, were able to immediately populate that and identify new, uh, new players on the battlefield. And so um, give me one second. I see John Sanders calling me. Give me one All right, Reed, um, uh, John Sanders had a little bit of a challenge getting back into the call. So if you could uh, work with him to get it, I'm gonna send you his info.
So while we're uh, while we're working on getting John Alexander back online, he's apparently having some trouble logging back into the webinar. Apologies for that, uh, folks. I was describing some of his background. Um, and so uh, one of the things that John Alexander did, uh, uh, as I mentioned, while he was uh, running cyber command, running NSA, was be able to take this intelligence and move it to real time um, and make it actual for warfighters. Um, and John Alexander's continued that mission after leaving uh, leaving NSA. He uh, he created this company, Ironet Cybersecurity, where I, where I spent some of my daytime. Um, and there were uh, bringing behavioral intelligence uh, to bear on cyber threat problems for industry. Um, so that's so what we'll talk to him about today when we get get him back online. Our plan is to talk about um, how he sees threats in the world today, um, in particular in light of the COVID scenario. Um, what we see our enemies in uh, in uh, in China, Iran, our strategic competitors in China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, um, what they're doing out in this space, both um, when it comes to cybersecurity, but also uh, when it comes to uh, threats in in the real world, the physical world, we've seen Iranian proxies uh, coming up against U.S. forces in in uh, in Iraq. Uh, we've seen um, increased activity, covert messaging from the Iranians and the Russians and the Chinese, uh, both overt and covert messaging about COVID, uh, about their ability to deal with the issue. Um, and so we've seen a lot of that. And so the world's becoming a more dangerous place today. And so that's some of the stuff we'll talk to John Sander about once we have him back online. Um, and uh, and uh, so we're working on that actively. Um, in the meantime, I might tell you a little bit about the National Security Institute since I have a I have a uh, I have a captive audience over of over hundred people, um, and uh, and um, so uh, one of the things that we're seeing um, uh, at NSI is a real challenge in the think tank space and the academic space, which is to say, um, historically we've seen a lot of organizations out there uh, looking at the issues of defense, foreign policy, national security. The gap that NSI identified in this space was that a lot of the conversations, particularly in academia that took place, were focused on, uh, when you talk about national security issues, were focused on issues of privacy, civil liberties, and the like. NSI wanted to bring a lot more of that national security aspect to bear, bring some expertise in from the government, a lot of former government folks, a lot of former uh, people that were in the Bush and Obama administrations, as well as folks from Capitol Hill, and bring that conversation together to have a much more honest and open dialogue about national security issues, not just in the think tank space, but in academia. The other thing we wanted to bring to bear in this space was uh, the idea that policymakers don't have time to read 100-page academic articles, or even 50-page academic articles, or even 25-page academic articles. What they have time to read, right, is a five-page piece that has the thought of a 30-page piece behind it. So in a lot of ways, what we're doing is trying to bring together really smart people to talk about some of the hard issues, have honest conversations, candid conversations, and then combine those thoughts into a form factor that policymakers and the administration on Capitol Hill can really take advantage of. And so at NSI, that's what we're doing. If you look on our website, nationalsecurity.gmu.edu, you'll see a lot of these papers and the like. Um, and so, uh, so that's one of the things we're working on. And John Alexander's, we're, we're glad to have people like General Alexander on our board of advisors, along with some of the folks I see on the, on the line here, uh, Dmitry Alperovich, uh, the former CTO uh, and co-founder of, of uh, CrowdStrike. I see that uh, it looks like General Alexander has rejoined by phone. Uh, John Alexander, thanks. Thanks for coming back. Uh, I apologize we don't have you on video right now, but uh, it sounds like you're back. Are you at least back by phone? I'm back by phone, and we'll figure out. So it looks like the network up here in uh, Columbia went down or around Columbia, where I am. Uh, but I'm on the phone, so uh, I don't know where I got cut off, but I had a great discussion about my background. Uh, so you want me to pick up there, Jamil? Well, that'd be great, sir. We, I just I went through your history at NSA. I talked a little bit about the work you did to bring uh, real-time intelligence to warfighters. So if you could just uh, hop on that conversation, your time at NSA, your time at U.S. Cyber Command, you know, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, so I uh, got to NSA in 2005. Uh, it was um, a tremendous opportunity working with great people who are doing a great mission to protect our nation and our way of life. They're unsung heroes in my, from my perspective because what they're doing for our country is they're the ones that go out and track the bad guys, terrorists. And most of what we did when I was there was uh, the war on terrorism and supporting our troops in Afghanistan and Iraq and hotspots like Iran and hotspots like uh, Eastern Europe and the South China Sea. Folks did their job, these military and civilian personnel, day and night without very much fanfare, without getting much thanks from the public, but they were always there to help the country. It was an honor and privilege to work with them. As you may have mentioned, in 2010, after the Defense Department got hacked, 
we came back in and said, okay, we've got to now create a command that can look at cyber. And Secretary Gates was instrumental in making that happen. That's how we got U.S. Cyber Command stood up. Uh, it was a great opportunity uh, and uh, privilege to also lead that. It was important to have Cyber Command and NSA working together because they both work in the same area. And Cyber Command, quite frankly, needed the technical expertise of NSA to actually do their job. So there's a dependency there, and I think that will remain. So that's kind of a quick overview. Other thoughts or questions, Jamil, on that part? Yeah, great, John. Great, sir. Really appreciate that. Um, I thought what we would do since, uh, since we lost a few minutes, just jump right into the current situation we find ourselves, right? The COVID-19 uh, pandemic is upon us. It's been upon us now for months. People are working from home. Um, how do you see the global threat environment? One of the things we talked about while you were uh, while you were off was the fact that it seems like the world remains a dangerous place and continues to be dangerous. Our, our competitors, Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, uh, appear to be still doing stuff. How do you see the global threat environment as it stands today? Um, and how should we be thinking about that in light of the COVID pandemic, sir? So <clears throat> I think that you know, when you look at the global threat, this is, the COVID-19 only amplifies the threat issues that we're going to face. Now, there's already global competition going on in 5G and quantum computing, machine learning and AI, in nuclear, and now in the biotech community. And it's not only a fight for resources, it's a fight for maintaining and protecting civil liberties and privacy. And countries out there, as they grow, are going to want to change their way of life. And we're going to go from uh, shoving and pushing into potential conflicts. You can see this now with the issues in the South China Sea. You see it especially in uh, the Middle East uh, with actions that Iran is taking against the Gulf states. And we see it um, from across uh you know, across the community. So if I were to, to jump forward, what I'm really concerned about is the way this is changing, the way the world is changing, the theft of intellectual property, the way that our nations have to, um, you know, has to fight to keep its own property, the tension between the U.S. and China, tension between the U.S. and Russia, uh, tension uh, between Iran and the U.S., all that's growing. I don't see a way around it. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's a tough area. And then if you add to it the economic conditions and now the issues with um, COVID-19, it's, it's made it a lot worse for everybody. So, well, yeah. um, so from my perspective, I think we're going to see um, a number of critical contests come up in this competition that will cause our country and others to, to look at this far differently. You're seeing a change in Europe already with the COVID-19 and their relationship with China. Right. So I think we're going to see changes like that around the world. Well, sir, you know, you've talked a lot about the, the theft of intellectual property. When you were director of NSA, you referred to it as the greatest transfer of wealth in modern human history. And, you know, the United States increasingly is, as we've all learned as a result of COVID, is not a manufacturing powerhouse. We are, uh, we historically have been, um, but we've become more of an intellectual powerhouse. We, we build uh, amazing technology. Uh, we, we sell it around the world. Uh, some of our most successful companies today are in the internet space. Um, how, do we, how do we think about the protection of intellectual property if a lot of that is walked out the back door to another nation state and it's being repurposed there for economic purposes? How can we best protect that information um, and, and think about this as a national level threat as opposed to just sort of the intellectual property of a single company or single entity. Well, you hit on some great points. First and foremost, the, our nation is built on our economy. You know, we have a great intelligence community, a great military, a great government because we have the economy that can really serve as a foundation for that. That economy is dependent in our future on the intellectual property that we create. So think about the creation of things like, um, you know, uh, Cisco and Huawei, theft of intellectual property um, by Huawei against Cisco. It now, that transfer of intellectual property 
and now China's subsidizing of that has changed the balance of how we would have competed in 4G and 5G. And now think about that across all the sectors. It's amazing that our joint strike fighter, China has one that's almost an exact copy of it. When you think about that, that means that the future funds that we would make from this is no longer available, right? It's gone. Uh, so we've got to step back and think about how are we gonna protect it? We cannot allow this to go on. We are losing, our nation is losing. And that's the, that's the issue that I think we face right now. We're losing because we all try to uh, defend um, ourselves and we're getting uh, picked off piecemeal. Every company really defends itself. We share information, but it's not shared at the level and the, and the type that we think we should share it at when you, when you think about it. So um, if I were to uh, jump forward on that, I would say you've got to address the problem with uh, our uh, protection of all our companies, the intellectual property, and the way we look at ourselves in cyber. And that, as you know, is collective defense. Yeah, so, sir, you, you, you've mentioned collective defense uh, in the past. That you and I have written about it together. I, I think it's really an interesting concept because, you know, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which I know you were an expert advisor to, um, really sort of put this out there just in the last few, the last month or so when they released their big report. Uh, this is a commission made up of members of Congress, a couple of senators, a couple of members of the House, um, a, a number of outside experts. Um, and one of the things they said was that we need a fundamentally new social compact when it comes to cyberspace, that the private industry and the government have got to work more closely together, that we need this collective defense construct. What does that mean? I mean, does that mean that, that, uh, that, that it's, is it just about information sharing? Is it about collaboration? What, is, what does collective defense in cyberspace look like to you? And, and why, do we need, why do we need this? Why is that so important in a, in a world in which, um, you know, we're being attacked by, uh, by other nation states? Well, I, okay. all right, I'm back in. Um, had to reboot the computer and everything. Okay, so um, what, for us as a nation right now, when we think about defending a company, the contract that we have right now is I'm going to defend company A. So imagine 100 banks. Every bank right now defends itself. They share information when they know it, but they only, they only share some stuff. If, if an event occurs and they don't see it, they can't share it. And so there's two sets of ways that adversaries can attack a network. They sneak by the signature-based systems, that which is set up. So they know to check the windows, check the doors, but there are other ways to get into the banks. And so it's virtual, it's stealing, it's going in. How do you protect all that? And how do we do this now in cyber? And if you think about the way banks today operate, every bank, and let's take 100 mid-sized banks with 10 to 20 people, they end up trying to do the best job to defend themselves. But they can't see events that are hitting other banks because that would really benefit them. So it's like an air traffic control system, but everybody has their own little air traffic control system for their area. They can't see the nation and they don't benefit from the other 99 banks that are also getting hit by the same thing. If they would, then instead of having 10 or 20 people working in your bank, you could have 1,000 to 2,000 working together in a collective defense. That's a big shift in the way we think about cybersecurity and what we need to do for the future. So I think that's the big, the big jump forward uh, and where we need to go on this. So I think that's interesting. I mean, you know, we've always thought about when, when we're attacked as a nation, you know, it's the job of the government to defend us, right? I mean, you don't expect Target or Walmart to have surface to air missiles defending against Russian bear bombers. Uh, but today in cyberspace, we do expect that of every company in the economy. We expect, um, you know, uh, Citibank and JP Morgan and, and individual companies to defend against Russia and China. Is that a really a realistic expectation? Even if everyone shared all the information and the government were to provide its intelligence, is it really realistic to expect individual companies to defend against a nation state threat? Can they ever win? Can they ever keep up? Well, so, you know, you know, the answer to that is no, we can't. If you're, if a small company with 10 to 20 people is going against 
an advanced persistent threat, they lose every time. And so the second part of this whole construct is imagine if you could now bring together those 100 banks working together and you could share the information anonymized and uh, free from intele intellectual property and personally identifiable information. So only the threat related information, but share that at speed, what's hitting the banks. Right now, there is no 911 call to stop the missile. So the, the federal government is really ends up doing incident response. So for air traffic control, that means after the plane crashes, the government comes in and says the plane crashed. Well, people on the plane don't want that. They want the plane to fly. They don't want them to bump into each other. So we have air traffic controllers. We don't have that in cyber. And there's no way for the government to know that a bank is getting hit. So the government can't see it. So we have to share that. And you're right in your statement that governments and individuals need to work together. This is the new social pact that we've got to come up with. We created this country based on, in our constitution, based on the common defense. It's in the preamble of the constitution. It doesn't say for the common defense, except for cyber, or unless it's technical, or unless it's hard. It's for the common defense. And that's what we need to do in cyber. We need to now step back and say, look, this is a new area. This is where our wealth, our future, our intellectual property, the value of this nation is now in this network. It's in our data. It's in all this intellectual property that we've created. We have to protect it as a nation because our nation's future is this economy. And this economy is based on the intellectual property and the values that we're creating here. Got it. And so I actually want to want to leave cyber for a moment and talk about this large direct issue of the economy that you've talked about. But before I do that, I want to mention to folks, General Alexander, I'm going to keep talking here for about another 10 minutes, and then we'll take questions from the audience. We've had a few questions raised, submitted on Twitter. I see some folks already active in the chat uh, sending questions. You can also send questions in through the Q&A function here on the Zoom webinar. So feel free to add, ask questions, and we'll ask a few of them. I apologize, we won't be able to get to all of them, but we will try to ask as many of them as we can get through. And we'll go to that in about 10 minutes. So think of your questions, put them in the question box, and we'll get, we'll get right to those. But in the meantime, General, coming back to uh, your point about the economy and how critical the economy is to our national security and our success, you know, we're in an economic crisis. I think nobody can doubt uh, that our economy has been drastically challenged in ways we would never have expected uh, by COVID-19. You run a small business, a startup, uh, you know, that's been, that's been VC funded. How do you as a private sector leader now, stepping out of your role as a government leader and your, and your former role and your current role as a private sector CEO and a startup CEO, how do you think about the current economic environment? What are you doing in your company and, and, and with your employees and with your funders as you think about the challenges that COVID presents both to us as an economy, but to startup companies like yours? Uh, so that's a great question because I think everybody on this call has probably been if you had imagined last summer, we say, you're going to be forced to stay in your house for two months and shelter in place because of a virus. Everybody would have thought we're crazy. And we're doing that. And the impact on the economy, you can see the number of unemployed has jumped to something like 30, 30 some million uh, as of today. Uh, business has slowed down. You're seeing a contraction here and in Europe. That contraction and the impact on all that is having a significant impact on business. It's slowing down. And that means as it slows down, how do you keep people employed? Uh, that's tough for everybody. We've made a decision in our company. We're going to keep everybody employed. Uh, we're going to work our way through it. We're cutting expenses where we can. Our co-CEO, Bill Welch, as you know, is cutting expenses where we can to keep our people employed and to keep moving forward. Because at the end of the day, one of the vital things our nation needs is good cybersecurity and the collective defense we create and we can do will help. But it does impact us and it's impacting everybody else. Uh, I think everybody is being impacted this in one way or the other. And, you know, it's, it's trite to say we'll be better when we get out of it. But the fact is we're losing uh, a quarter plus of a year uh, for what we'd normally economically make up. And so that quarter loss, you're not going to get that back. What we can do is race to go forward. Uh, and that may extend into uh, June 
uh, or July, and then we come out of it for a little bit, and then there's concern about a second wave, and what do we do? Bottom line, you know, in my talking to uh, state governments and others, we've got to bring the economy back up, and we've got to think about how we control the virus, the flare-ups. I've been impressed with what the states are doing. They understand we've got to test. We've got to isolate those that have it. We've got to keep that down, but we've got to bring business back. We've got to bring back the, the future of our nation, and we've got to work that hard. That's a tough issue. And I think what the government's doing to push money in and say, okay, so keep those employed. So that's a help. That keeps people employed. You can do it through unemployment or you can do it through your industry. I think doing it through industry is the best way because it keeps people working and it makes it better for our country. Um, and <clears throat> that, that's part of our future. So we are, this will eventually pass. I'm concerned that it could have an extended period. If you look at the number of new cases and the number of deaths, while it's starting to peak some, I think that could go a longer ways at too high a level before it starts to come down. Because our country's so big, you know, it's coming down in New York City and others, but now others are starting to come up. And when you look at the collective picture, it's kind of a, a slight downturn, but not, not big enough. Right. So one of the things people have raised concerns about uh, when it comes to our economy is uh, not just that the U.S. economy is going to be weakened, but that there may be long-term structural implications for the, the place that China has in the world economy, uh, the moves they're making overseas to provide resources to other nation states, uh, whether it's PPE or monetary resources. A few weeks ago, the most, uh, the most liked tweet in, uh, in, or the most retweeted tweet um, in all of Italy was from the Chinese embassy talking about the support that Italy had given to China back when they'd had a natural disaster and the support that China was providing to Italy now in the context of COVID. How, does, how do we think about our, our role as a nation state uh, you know, relative to other countries, particularly a strategic competitor like China, when it comes to COVID and as they seem to be coming out of it, and again, we know the numbers may have, may have some differences and they may not be completely accurate, but as they appear to be coming out of it and, and restarting their economy and their production, is that a concern for us strategically in the long run uh, that we're, we're going to be hampered uh, in the global competition? Um, I think there are two um, confronting uh, acts going on right now. The one that you said about China helping out, and the other one, which is China being blamed for the cause of this by not being completely transparent up front. I see more in Europe looking at China and say, you know, Italy, yep, you did great, thanks for helping us, but you also kept flights coming in for Wuhan into mid-February. And those flights were from the most infected areas and really lit Northern Italy on fire. Look at all the deaths that we had. That was huge. And I think as people go back and look at that, they're gonna to start to look at China and say, you weren't, you stopped people coming out of Wuhan into other parts of China, but you let them go to other parts of the world. That I think will weigh heavily on this. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not throwing rocks at anybody because we will never have all the facts and no one knows for certain all the things that went on. But as I look at it, I think that is, you know, when you look at the build articles out of Germany uh, and their pushback and what is happening in the UK and elsewhere, I see more traction on that side than I do on thanks for the masks. Oh, by the way, you bought those masks at 75 cents a piece. You're selling them for $8.50. And you bought them worldwide, 2 billion of them. And now you're being the benefactor giving them back at 10 times the cost. So it's those kind of things I think that make this more difficult. Sure. Thanks, sir. So um, I'm gonna to turn to questions from the audience because we've got so many questions coming in uh, that will they could easily take up the remaining half hour that we have. Um, so, uh, former Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Lynn Wells uh, asks, "What what intelligence community? What should the intelligence community be doing or thinking about um, and and changing about what it's done historically in response to COVID nineteen? What lessons can be learned from COVID nineteen for the intelligence community that you were once a key part of?" That's a great question, <laughs> uh, and hi, Lynn. I'm thanks for uh, taking part of this. Uh, it was an honor and privilege to serve with you. I think one of the things that we should look at 
is what are the tools that the Intel community has for tracking terrorists and other things and going through big data that could help us more quickly understand where flare-ups are gonna occur and how we do that and protect civil liberties and privacy. I think what that means is not, not having Intel professionals do this, but giving the tools to public health officials who are gonna be responsible for detecting the virus, understanding who's got it, who's got it, and going through the isolation and the tracking and contact portion of that. We can help that, that's one part. The second part is in machine learning and AI. As we think about, you know, it's, it's extremely interesting to look at behavioral analytics in a network and the human body. The way the human body fights viruses is with the human leukocyte antigen. You've got this thing that goes after it. And you can go and we can create this huge parallel between defending a network and defending the human body. And both sides can learn from that. And as you get in there, uh, passing tools back and forth to help advance the medical community and to help advance big data and help defend networks, there are a lot of synergies there. And it's interesting that many of the behavioral analytics that we use are actually also valuable for cancer research. So, interesting. Sir, one of our, uh, one of our uh, audience members, Davika asks, um, that some talks about 5G standards, uh, and some have suggested that uh, part of the problem with 5G standards today is that they're all, a lot of the security features are optional. Is this another example of sort of profit motives driving security instead of security driving uh, the, the protection of these networks? These are obviously huge issues. Uh, the security of 5G is going to be critical going forward. Um, should we be concerned that, that companies aren't doing enough to secure 5G and, and, and that these standards should be set in a different manner? Yeah, I think, well, you know, it's, it's always the thing that we point to is it should be built in at the beginning. You need to build it in. You need to make it part of it. 5G is, uh, you know, going to be like 4G for our economy. Look at what 4G did over a decade in growing it. So it, it's huge for us in terms of protecting intellectual property, protecting communications and everything else. So, yeah, we absolutely should bake that in. And, and you know, that's fairly straightforward. Sir, uh, Dmitry Alperovich, uh, one of our uh, NSI uh, folks uh, and former CTO and founder of CrowdStrike, um, asks about Russia and its, and its pioneering use of disinformation. Um, we're now seeing China ramp up its work in disinformation. Why are we in the US so bad at, at comparatively at least to China and Russia at disinformation and political warfare? What can we do to get better and uh, to target our adversaries uh, in the same way they're coming after us? So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. So I'll give you my, my humorous view of this. You know, we talk about disinformation and then you think about all the fake news that goes on. So sometimes we have, we're just, we're just naive in the way we do business. Uh, we really are. Uh, others see uh, planting false stories out there as a way to, to take action. You mentioned Russia and Dimitri, it's good to, to hear from you and um, and it has been an honor to work with you over the years. I think if you think about what Russia has done in deception and disinformation, look at what they've done in the Ukraine. There's a great story about them planning a story in the press about ethnic Ukrainians bayonetting a three-year-old boy and putting his body in the yard of, of his Russian parents. And when people went to that site, it wasn't a Russian house, it was a Ukrainian house, and there was no body there. It was completely made up. But what it did is it got the ethnic Russians and the ethnic Ukrainians fighting. Um, they do that, others do that, plant false seeds. So we don't do that. And as a consequence, you know, our, our false seeds are we don't tell the whole story or we politicize it. Uh, and so I think for us, the, the issue that we need to face as a nation is how do we get the facts out there for the public to understand exactly what's going on? That's the key for the future, just the facts. How do we do this and put those out there? And if you, know, you listen to all the talk shows, they're going to be politicized. They'll give you this view or this view. Uh, what about the, the view? What about what's actually going on? I think that's, that's actually needed for our nation. And, you know, I, I absolutely believe we've got to 
figure out how to get Congress to work together uh, for the good of the country. Put this aside, things like COVID-19, things like defending our nation and other things, put aside politics, do what's good for the country. Everybody step up. Um, and uh, so that, that's my thought. That's, that's a so, political announcement. Well, I was, gonna, I was gonna say, some people might say, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, you know, sort of ask what, what it might be a tough question, but it sounds like you, what you're saying is that the right answer is we shouldn't, we shouldn't do disinformation the way that our enemies do. We should just let the truth speak for itself. We should get more facts out there, uh, put the real story out there. And that's the best defense against, some people often say, the best uh, defense against bad speech is more speech, not less speech. Um, so is that your view? Is, and, and if that is your view, is that- Naive. Is that, yeah, is that naive? I don't, I didn't, I didn't want to say that, but yeah, is that naive? Is that, is that a, is that, is that too easy to well, we'll just, we'll just speak the truth and that'll be fine. Um, do we think that's really, in a world in which our, our, our opponents are actively using our own open democracy against us, you know, putting out messages on both sides of issues just to create dissension in our own country. Is it, is it enough to just say, we'll speak the truth and that'll be good enough? Well, I, <clears throat> it, this is a tough question and every administration, you know, when I served um, both in the Bush and the Obama administrations, uh, these are the types of questions you say, so what's the right thing to do? And both sides, they wrestle with this. Inside, you know, without the public there, this was a tough question. What do you do? And I think it always came down as, you know, here's what we stand for as a nation. We stand for these values. And if we stand for those values, then that's the way we should operate. Now, that doesn't mean that we should be naive. It doesn't mean that when you're in war, you know, uh, Sun Tzu would say, yeah, deception is the art of war. So if we're at war, that's one thing. If we're not at war, then we should step back. Now, is it a cold war? Is this something that we're going to fight? Is this an intelligence fight where you're now going to take covert action and allow them to do things? That may be. But in general, I think our nation and our closest allies really want us to act with the greatest integrity. At the end of the day, we should be known by our words and our deeds. And I think those that, that do like you're saying should be called out and they lose for that. At the end of the day, they would lose. And we really don't wanna be a part of that. So, Sir Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz is on, uh, asks, uh, what, about a, what about, is it the case that a good offense is the best defense? And if so, what, how should we be thinking about offense when it comes to the cyber realm? So, uh, Secretary, uh, honor and privilege to serve with you over the years, uh, so thanks. Thanks for that question. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree that a offense is the best. And so earlier on, when we talked about having government and uh, the public and private sector work together in cyber, it's actually to give the government view of what's hitting our nation, allowing them to use offensive tools to stop it. And in some cases, it's knowing what the adversary is going to do. We know who they are. We know where they are. And we should make sure we watch them. But we don't know all of them. And so by working with our, uh, between the government and the uh, private sector, we can build that air traffic control picture for cyber. And you're right, offense wins. Shut them down. Uh, I think there were some public statements made about what Cyber Command, NSA, the government did in the 2018 elections. They went on the offense and they shut them down. Very successful, great work. So I think that's, that's a, an administration call, but I do think it's the right thing. So thanks for that question, Mr. Secretary. So uh, Blaine Headley asks whether, it's, uh, whether we can expect uh, a Geneva Convention style uh, agreement uh, on cyber. Is that, is that a realistic thing to expect in the current environment? And if so, how would that come about? If not, why not? So I'm not sure on that. I, I just don't know. I think the issue comes down to how do you defend yourself? And what in a Geneva Convention, like in cyber, if you say, I can't fire back uh, for somebody who's attacking me and block them in their site, you've just made this really difficult. So how do you do that? Um, so this creates a dilemma. And when you think your way through that dilemma, what you end up with is okay. Step one, 
I have to have a better defense. It has to be a collective defense where we as a nation can work our country together and we can share that view with our allies, those we trust. And the better we do that collective defense, the easier it will be for us to block others. And then once you get to a certain standard, then it may be possible in the distant future to say, okay, do we now come up with a Geneva-like convention in cyber? We know we can block you, you know we can block you, so why don't you just knock it off? Yeah. Uh, sir, one of our uh, questioners, uh, JPD, I think it's Jim Denoy, um, asked, is it, and this is a question I know you wrestled with when you were in the government, so uh, is it time to separate the positions of Commander U.S. Cyber Command, the, the, the entity you created, and the Director NSA? It's been recommended, not yet implemented. Um, what are the pros and cons for cybersecurity um, in your mind? So, you know, this came up, I'll tell you, uh, it was an honor and privilege to, to serve under and with Secretary Bob Gates, the Secretary of Defense. And we wrestled with this issue at the beginning. How do we do this? And what we came up with is that you don't want to split your assets up, you want to bring them together. And he was all in plus saying, you need to be in charge. And I actually want to do three things. We need to bring all our cyber resources together across the government, put them all together so that you have critical mass. If you start to split them up, the concern that I have is that you put NSA over here and it operates under one rubric with all their tools. And you've got cyber command over here. You've got defend the nation. You've got tools to defend the nation. And now you have two people that are now arguing about how they do that. And what happens with that is one of those lose. If this is the four star, cyber command is a four star and NSA becomes a three star, NSA loses. If you make them two four stars, the nation loses because now cyber command is gonna say, well, if I can't rely on NSA for it, I'm gonna go build it myself. Now I'm gonna get a bigger budget and we just lost as a country. So putting it together, there's, you know, I am hugely impressed with the technical talent of NSA. Cyber Command can't do its job without that talent. And to rebuild the NSA and put it under Cyber Command would be crazy. And trying to say, well, I want to split those up is also crazy because they are both working in those. So where I sit in my experience in, in working that with Secretary Gates was we wouldn't do it. And I think that's the right, the right answer. So one of the uh, things that you went through when you were at uh, NSA, well, among, among many of the challenges you faced uh, was the disclosure of some government surveillance programs, major disclosure. Um, and you had a particular interaction with President Bush when, uh, when this happened. Could you tell, tell our audience the story that, of your interaction with the president and, and what that tells you about leadership? Because I think, you know, in a lot of ways, I think it was really, I think as you described it in the past to me, it was really an example of what you thought leadership was about. So, yeah, so I'm gonna give the story kind of at the beginning, if that's okay. Sure. So, you know, it was, you know, it was great. I, I had a chance to, sec, uh, President Bush was an amazing person to work with. And we had uh, created the new Trailblazer system. Trailblazer had been canceled. And I was called into the White House, uh, sat down with he, uh, Vice President Cheney, Rumsfeld, the four of us, and I gave him a pitch on it. And he's nodding his head when I said, we're going to build a cyber defense tool just like you did. Well, I thought, shoot, he's in, he's in. So we're gonna go build that. Um, six months later, he comes up to NSA. And uh, this is, uh, I think it was the 2006 time frame, And the helicopter lands and my house is on the parade field. So my wife, the signature says, you can't get up to the windows, you know. But you know, you can see the president, he comes down. And, and I asked the secret service, they said, do I ride? with the president in his car, because they brought his car out. So the helicopters can come in and they got his car there. Do I ride with him or do I ride in my car? And the Secret Service guys goes, General, if the president tells you to get in his car, get in his car. If the president doesn't, get in your car. And I thought, I can do that. I got that. So I'm, uh, the helicopter lands. I go, welcome for me, Mr. President. And he goes, General, get in the car. We got to talk. And he was, I was like, whoa, where'd he go? He was like, uh, a sprinter. He jumped in the car, so I quickly got after him. He got in the jump seat. Now I'm in his seat. And I thought, where's the press when you need him, right? Here I am. Get a picture. Um, and he goes, General, 
I got two problems we got to discuss, two issues with you. And I thought, uh-oh, what did I do? I mean, you know, I was always in trouble, as you know. And I thought, oh, what, what could I have done? And he goes, first, first issue. They tell me you got too many bosses. We're going to fix that right now. And I thought, oh, danger, Will Robinson. My bosses are the president, the vice president, Secretary Rumsfeld. It's uh, Negroponte, the director of national intelligence. It's Cambone. It's the chairman, and it's a commander Stratcom. All of them outranked me. I looked the president right in the eye, and I told him, I love all my bosses. They're all good to me. And they actually were. Everybody was helpful. You know, everybody worked to help us do our mission, and nobody overreached. It was, you have a mission to do, tell me how I can help you. And it really was like that. I was really impressed. Secretary Rumsfeld, you know, he, for as tough a person as he could be, when the White House asked me to do something, he didn't get in the way. He said, that you're supposed to do that. Go do it. And don't, don't come to me and just do it. The second issue, he goes, General, General, this issue with it, terror surveillance program is going to get really bad, really bad. Here's the deal. You defend the nation, I'll take the heat. And he did, every step of the way. It was the greatest act of leadership I've seen. We went from there. Uh, we went through a couple of meetings, and then he got in a press conference. He stood up in front of the American people and said, this is my program to protect our nation. It's not an NSA. It's not an Intel. It's a presidential program to collect information to stop terrorist acts and defend this country. He had behind him the vice president, Hadley, McConnell, and myself. So it was, you know, from my perspective, um, it was the greatest act of leadership that I saw and anyone in 40 years of service. Thanks, sir. Um, so uh, Stephen Jackson asks, uh, one of our former students at, at George Mason asks, um, can you touch upon the current situation in Afghanistan? Um, do you have thoughts on the current negotiations and the threat uh, the Taliban will return to their uh, former bad ways or totalitarian rule if, if, we, if we leave there precipitously? A uh, tough question. And I'm not tracking the Taliban uh, U.S. negotiations as closely uh, as I probably should to answer that question. But let me tell you, based on my experience, uh, this is a really tough place. Remember that 9-11 thoughts were hatched in this area because it wasn't governed, it wasn't contained. And if you think about what we went through from 2001 to, to today, it's because of that. So the Taliban saying that they would do this, does that become a free zone for terrorists to now feel free to act? That's the issue that we really got to show that we've got that under control. So I think before we can take steps to pull troops out and to do that, we've got to be assured and convinced that that in fact will happen. I think that's, that's when we get to the bottom line of it. That makes sense. Uh, Jacob Mendel asks, uh, given that the U.S. has superior military power, um, how bad does a cyber attack need to get uh, to, for us to respond with a non-cyber response, a cross-domain response? Do we need to have a red line and a clear stated policy about here's where, here's where it's going to come or we're going we're to come at you with, more, with, with, uh, with a real-world kinetic response? So I think the problem with a red line, <clears throat> when you state a red line, uh, people expect you to act when that red line has been crossed. So by not stating a red line, you have the flexibility of acting when you determine that it has crossed the threshold that you yourself has. Of course, the problem with that is it doesn't act as a deterrent for those who would be concerned about over-responding. So actually some of the things that President Trump has done has really caused people to step back and say, okay, what's he gonna do? I'm not sure. Will he hit me with A, B, or C? And the answer is he could. And so that may be the best deterrent is to have them unsure of what we do, but they know we'll act. And the uh, administrations have maintained that authority to respond with either cyber or any other act of political power to include military. And I suspect that if you cause uh, tremendous harm, you could do that. Uh, and I think what the administration will weigh, has weighed, and will continue to weigh is what's the appropriate level of response. What sends the message that says, don't do this again. And that, you know, and if you can do it with cyber and, and you don't risk human life 
and that's merited, then I think that's a good thing. So in some ways, it's sort of strategic ambiguity, leave, leave our options open, uh, but make it clear that we will respond at a time and place of our choosing. Right. So staying on this issue of deterrence, Sunil Yu, uh, who's the, the creator of the cyber defense matrix, I think that we, you and I just actually talked about it in the last week, um, and is one of our NSI fellows writing a book, um, asks about deterrence in the context of the pandemic, right? So he says, look, you know, uh, we're seeing a lot of attackers targeting those involved in pandemic response, vaccine research companies, hospitals, and the like, it would seem this is a good example of places where nations want to work together to deter these kind of attacks and say, look, as a world community, if you attack people trying to do vaccine research or hospitals, we're going to combine efforts and come after you. Why, why aren't we seeing that kind of, uh, you know, sort of a global or at least a, even an allied response uh, to deter those kind of attacks? I think the issue is visibility. By the time you know something's gone on, it's, it's two months old, three months old. So create the visibility to see it like we do for air traffic control. If you do that and you can say, here's what they're trying to do. They're attacking, look at this. This threat actor is trying to steal intellectual property from aircraft makers in the US, Europe, and all these other countries. All of you see that? And oh, by the way, they're doing this in the medical community. They're doing this in this community and they're doing this in this community. Shut it down and have it visible so that everybody can see that. If you can create that visibility, then you have a way that decision makers can actually come up with concrete plans to respond. Got it. One of, uh, on, on this issue, continue on this issue of deterrence, um, uh, one of our, uh, one of our folks, Mark Erste from Brett Shabbat's office asked about um, your thoughts on using non-cyber means to achieve deterrence, right? We talked a little about this in the, your answer to the earlier question. Uh, but in this context where Congress is thinking about what to do about, uh, about Chinese cyber threats, um, should we, is naming and shaming enough? Um, are there, uh, should we make clear that we'll sail, we'll sail a carrier battle group through the Straits of Taiwan if it gets really bad? How, how far do we go um, uh, when it comes to some of these threats that don't have necessarily a kinetic effect uh, here? So that gets back to, you know, conversation. Yeah, it gets back to the earlier question. What you'd want to do is save your options and have a complete set and use each one um, and the flexibility to do that to achieve the objectives that you need to achieve. The theft of intellectual property is, is the greatest transfer of wealth in history. We're losing huge amounts there. You know, we can, we can gripe about it. We ought to go fix that. We ought to solve that. Um, we ought not to say you're stealing our stuff, that we leave our money out on a, on a park bench in New York City, and every night we go home and then come back, it's gone. In the morning, we're going to think either the people in New York can't read or they're stealing our money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it is that if, if you say, it's not enough to say, please don't steal our intellectual property. You've got to defend it. And we don't do a good job of that collectively. Yeah, got it. Uh, one last question, sir, before we wrap up, and I apologize to all the folks. I see a lot of folks that I know out there who've asked questions. I apologize. We're not going to get to you. Uh, we're short on time and apologies for the earlier technical challenges. Uh, but uh, Jennifer Fernick asks about uh, private sector penetration testing and vulnerability research. We've seen a lot of that effort uh, to be devoted to uh, helping uh, people protect themselves, companies protect themselves. If you could pick anything that, uh, that governmental, public-facing civilian security researchers, non-governmental, I should say, uh, would pay attention to, what should they be focused on? What, what can uh, civilian researchers be looking at to best help uh, private sector critical infrastructure entities? What could they be looking at in terms of threats? I think it's understanding the different ways the threat's coming at it. So if you look at the incident response framework, it shows how they get in. It shows all the steps of what an adversary would do to get in helping people understand what's going on in their network and then what it takes to actually defend it and then how you make that visible is I think the key. So from an incident response, you know, it's amazing some of the stuff that's done. And I've, I've read some of those books. I, I know you're surprised by that. Um, and as you look at that and you think of all the different tools, whether it's the Manion tool set or Yara or one of these other tools that you look at, what you want to do is you want to say, so how do we educate people on they're going to try to get in doing this. So you want to defend here. You got to, you got to track for vulnerabilities. They're going to try to fish you. So you got to do this here. 
And then if they, they're going to get through, so you've got to have the visibility in your network to see lateral movement. You've got to see certificates that are being stolen. You've got to see all these things. How do you bring that to life? And how do you create a more comprehensive plan? But it shouldn't stop there. If you think about what that one company is going through, and then you look down the road, there's another company going through the same thing. What if they work together? What if they share? And the answer is the more you share, the faster you learn. And you can't buy enough experts. But we have enough experts in this nation if we work together to defend it. And that's really where we need to get. Terrific. Well, sir, listen, thank you for coming today. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Apro apologies again for the technical difficulties earlier. I uh, really appreciate doing this. Thank you for your 40 years of service. Uh, thanks for giving me a job at IronNet for being on our, uh, on our advisory board at MSI. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Over 100 of you were here with us, almost 130 at, at max today, 120 still with us. Thanks for coming. We'll be back in two weeks uh, with Congressman Will Hurd. So tune in uh, on the 21st uh, at 5 p.m. for Congressman Will Hurd. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and thanks, Jamil. Honored to work with you. Same here.